everybody, welcome to my channel. My name is Sharon and this is a channel that is dedicated to all things related to narcissism. I make videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on all types of topics related to narcissism. So if you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any videos. I would really appreciate it if you gave the video a thumbs up. It's a free way you can help me out. And definitely don't forget to leave a comment because I like to read what you have to say. So because today's Friday, what I typically do on Friday is I report to you where I stand in terms of getting the divorce from my narcissistic ex. It's a way to hold myself accountable. When I started doing that, things were going a very different way. At this point, on the advice of my attorney, what I'm doing now is I'm just holding on until December. For my kids and my safety, we're moving and then I'm going to file for divorce. So week by week, I'm just trying to hold on. I will have some things to do as time goes on and I'll definitely fill you in on them. But as of now, what I needed to do over the last week was hold on. And I did. I made it until today. Now, I do have some exciting news. This is really exciting news for me. This Sunday at 12 o'clock, I have an appointment to get a tattoo. I have, very unfortunately, my, my ex's name tattooed on my inner left wrist. I can't stand this tattoo. It causes me agony. Generally, I cover it up every single day. Either I put a Band-Aid over it or I have these, I call them vitamin stickers. There are these little, they look like stickers, but they release vitamins through your skin. I'll put that on them or I'll have a bracelet, something over it to cover it. I actually annoyed Joe over the summer because at one point my wrist was getting irritated, but it kept covering it up. So he kept telling me not to, but I kept doing it. And then eventually I had this big, ugly rash on my wrist. Then I had to uncover it for like two weeks. So not only did I have to see the name, but I had this rash all around it. So finally on Sunday, I'm getting it covered up. I, I can't wait. Now, I know I could get it laser removed, but for me, the cover-up is more cathartic. It helps with my healing a little bit more. What I'm going to do is I'm getting a phoenix rising, and that just fits where I feel like I am. I'm, I'm rising from the ashes of my narcissistic ex, and I'm very, very excited to be doing this. So I will post a picture of it on Sunday night on the community page. I have a feeling it's going to be kind of a large tattoo. I told my tattoo artist I was okay with that when I was talking to him about it. But what it's going to be is the feathers at the bottom of the phoenix are going to be going over his name. I already have a tattoo on my left arm. It's closer to my elbow, but it's on my inner arm. So by the time I get this other tattoo, I have a feeling my whole inner arm is going to be covered up. But you'll see. We'll see on Sunday. I'll post it, and you can let me know what you think. So wish me luck. I'm really excited about that. So I'm going to get into today's video, and I'm going to begin with a thought experiment. Have you ever heard somebody ask, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? In today's video, I'm going to discuss whether or not a narcissist exists without supply. So the philosophical idea presented is, do objects exist only when they are perceived? Now, because it's a thought experiment, this can be black and white. We're not going to have shades of gray where you can think, well, maybe an animal hears it. I'm speaking just a human, just a tree. So if there's no human around and the tree falls, does the sound exist? Sound is a vibration in the air transmitted to our senses through the ear and recognized as sound at our nerve centers. So if there's no ear to hear, does the sound still exist? Of course, the air vibration will still exist, but what happens if it doesn't hit a human ear? Does that matter? Now, what about a narcissist? If nobody gives a narcissist supply, do they exist? Now, if I stopped eating, eventually I'd starve to death. I could die even faster if I stopped drinking. Like so many of you, because I've lived in a situation with a narcissist where my soul was not being fed, I know I won't die if I don't get what I need from another person. I will feel pain, absolutely, but I won't die. I've lived that way, so I know. I know a lot of you, same thing. But what about a narcissist? So the other day, Joe left a comment under a video, and he said, we are not like them. For some reason, that really struck me. We really aren't. On a deep and profound level, we're not like them. Many of us spend inordinate amounts of time trying to understand narcissists, trying to change them, help them, cure them. These are our husbands, our wives, people we thought we knew. What I now believe is that really we don't know them. We never knew them. We can't relate to them or fully understand them. 
I'm not so sure we even really should. They're human on the outside, but inside, emotionally, they aren't. They destroy. They feed off of us. They use us. They need us, especially if you're an empath. Now, I didn't even know what an empath was until a few years ago. So much in my life has changed since a few years ago. My journey began in 2016. For the sake of time, and I have mentioned this in other videos, I'll just state I stopped being codependent in 2016. So that's what really was the beginning of my transformation. That was the best thing that has ever happened to me. For my ex, though, it was catastrophic. And this brings me back to the beginning of the video. Does a narcissist exist without supply? Narcissistic supply is the lifeblood of narcissists. It literally gives them their existence. Narcissists are fundamentally broken and fragile individuals. They don't have an inner frame. They're incapable of generating their own self-esteem. They struggle to build and maintain relationships. They truly are more like a parasite than a human, an organism that lives on or in a host. And while the parasite benefits, the host does not empaths are the narcissist host. So if you like to garden like I do, you know that certain bugs or animals target certain plants. So I know this ahead of time and I take it into consideration when I plant my garden. The bug or animal doesn't methodically plan to destroy my garden. It instinctively takes what it is attracted to. It's an instinct. Likewise, narcissists don't consciously think to themselves, hmm, I must find an empath to feed off of. It just happens. They instinctively know they need us and they need us because we supply them with their existence. So it's like that tree falling in the forest. Who is a narcissist without supply, without their artificial personality? Hang on, I'm getting there. But back to the empath for a minute. The reason it has to be an empath is simple. No one else would put up with a narcissist long term. An unaware empath is overflowing with supply. They're bubbling over with 300th chances for apologizing for things they didn't do, for believing that this time it's going to be different, essentially being completely oblivious to their own worth. An empath operating at full capacity is like a skeleton inside a body, the literal reason the body is not a blob on the floor. What happens if a narcissist loses supply? For a thought experiment, I'm going to assume that the narcissist has lost all forms of supply. So we're speaking on a catastrophic level here. Narcissists, particularly overt narcissists, like to keep multiple sources of supply. So they're like a wise investor. They have some stocks, some real estate, precious metals. They'll go from one source to another. They keep everyone in their environment reinforcing their false sense of self. It's going to take a lot more for them to fall into depletion. But for the sake of argument, we're going to go straight to the jugular. What happens when a narcissist does lose supply? When even the reinforcements fail? Does a narcissist exist anymore? There'll be stages to the collapse. They'll definitely fight on the way down. They'll become more and more desperate. A narcissist will take any supply, good or bad. So if you, as the supply, recognize your value and don't react to the insults, silent treatment, gaslighting, love bombing, you will see the narcissist begin to wither before your eyes. So what does it look like? What does a collapse look like? What does a narcissist look like without their empathetic skeleton holding them up? Prepare yourself. God has blessed me many times with being at the right place at the right time. And I've been able to save several wild animals who needed immediate help. So what happens is that I find an animal. I'll just mention one of the last animals I cared for to get my point across. So I was taking a walk with my kids and my daughter noticed something in the road up ahead. So as we got closer, I could see it was a chipmunk and it was just in the road. It was, mo it was moving, but only like its front part was moving. Its back legs were, it wasn't moving. It wasn't getting out of the road. It was literally going to get run over if we didn't do anything. So I went up to this chipmunk and I picked it up with my bare hands. It was totally fine. I picked it up. It didn't bite me or anything. I held it against my chest and I brought it back to the house. So I brought it back to the house and I put it in a cage and then I just let it rest so I could try to figure out what was wrong with it. 
So after it rested for a little bit, I examined it and there wasn't anything obviously wrong with it. Now at first, when I saw it, I thought maybe it was paralyzed because it wasn't getting out of the road and I didn't see its back legs moving. But as it got better, its back legs were moving. So I started treating it for shock. It appeared to be a baby chipmunk. It didn't look like it was an adult chipmunk. And I didn't know, you know, I'm trying to guess what might have happened to it. Did it, was it got by, was it caught by a hawk and dropped? Did it get nipped by a car, but not that bad? Did some other injury happen to it? So I didn't know, but we decided to take care of it. So I'm trying to take care of this. And as it recovered from the shock, it started perking up. But this chipmunk was very friendly. It, it was more like a pet. It let us pet it. We're holding it. It was drinking out of a bottle for me. It was fantastic. It was this cute little animal. I was actually worried at one point that I wasn't going to be able to release it because it was so friendly. However, as it got better, when it was ready for release, I knew it was ready for release because it started to fear me. So the same animal that let me pet it and care for it became afraid and knew it was trapped. It tried to free itself. That's what happens with a narcissist. They eventually realize that they're trapped, and that, but their cage is their mind. They can't get away. They need you. They need you to comfort them and soothe them. But if you don't do that, if you don't give them supply, they're trapped in their own mind. They have to have supply or they start acting like this wild animal, desperately trying to get away. If I'm drowning, I need air. Supply is a narcissist air. So I can describe my own ex to answer the question, do narcissists exist without supply? So I told you already that my awakening in 2016 was catastrophic to my ex. Another thing to realize is that he is a covert narcissist and is not like the wise investor with multiple sources of supply. He does have a small investment of supply elsewhere, and I'll get to that at the end. But a lifeblood of supply, that's me, and I don't provide any nourishment to him. He hangs on to hope, but that only translates into a barely perceptible pulse. A pulse sorry. I realize now that Everything I believed my ex was when we met was false. And it's been difficult for me to look back at who I thought he, he was, knowing who I now know who he is. I thought he had a big personality and energy and that he wanted what I did, what I still want, a family, financial success, friends, the stereotypical American dream. Like many of you, I had no idea that I was just the host to a parasite. So today... The best way for me to describe my ex is that he is pathetic. He goes to work and he sits in his car unless he's going to AA, and I'll get to that. His loss of supply for him means that he has no family. So not only did he lose me and the kids, but his extended family as well. He doesn't have any friends. He's burned every single bridge and he has no idea how to communicate or reestablish any relationships. The shock to me is still unbelievable. I still can't believe it. I really, it's, it's stunning to me. And I know a lot of people suffer from this. I mean, this is a father who has no idea if his kids are okay or not. He's okay living that way. He doesn't have any attachment to them. You know, these are my kids now. I think he looks at them that way. They might as well be a toaster or something like that. Now, lately, he's been sending me these texts every day. Every, for some, this has been happening for probably about two months now. In the morning and at night, he'll send me a text. And they say the exact same thing. It, it says in the morning, good morning, have a good day. Then at night, it'll say, good night, hope you had a good day or have a good night. This is a man in his 40s who has been married for almost 20 years. And all he can muster up is these stupid texts. I believe he thinks he's working on our relationship. The cluelessness stuns me. So when I get these texts, I don't respond hardly ever. I respond once or twice a week because I don't want to anger him. And in a weird way, it gives me the ability to keep tabs on him. When I say keep tabs on him, I'm trying to make it through until December. And he will go long stretches of time where I don't know what he's doing. So this way, I know that he's 
okay that he's not really mad or is there's not anything diabolical going on i'm able to keep some i have some degree of safety with this it, it does make me feel a little bit like i know what's going on but this is a man i mean truly these this is what he does he just sends these texts and i think he thinks he's doing something this is him without a skeleton when I saw him recently, I asked him some basic questions, just literal basic questions. And I said it nicely too. I was saying, like, I'll just try it. I'll tell you how I said it to him. So how are you doing? How's AA going? I mean, this is how I'm saying it. I wasn't saying it like, oh, how are you doing? Hmm, how's AA? I just said it nice. He was silent and it was awkward. That's why I even asked him in the first place. And he responded, why are you interrogating me? So basic human conversation was too much for him. He, like a majority of the time when I was with him, and this is why I started asking him these questions in the first place, he just stared at me. He was just looking at me. At the end, he took a plant out of his car and he just kind of pushed it into my hands. It was so awkward. It wasn't, you know, oh, I bought this for you. It was just all of a sudden like here. I mean, I, it, and it was still in the, he bought it at the grocery store. It was still in like the plastic grocery bag. At one point he asked if he could hold my dog. And when the dog cried, he handed him right back to me. He didn't have any ability to comfort or hold the dog that we got as a puppy together 12 years ago. This is a broken man with no ability to connect to how he used to live. He needs me to do it for him. And that's gone forever, but only one of us knows. There are some really bad times ahead for him. So here we have a man who used to live in a nice house with a nice family and a supportive wife. He woke up one day although he still doesn't know this and his wife wasn't codependent anymore. So today what his supply is, this, this is literally his supply, is bringing snacks to AA. He goes to work, he sits in his car and he goes to AA meetings, but the meetings are artificial. He goes and for an hour or so he's there and he isn't alone in his head, but afterwards it's back to his car and his goodnight text to me. Several months ago, I texted him a picture of our son and he replied, that he didn't recognize him. There's no regret. Narcissists can't look within. So it's like Joe said, we're not like them. So do narcissists exist without supply? You tell me. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much for watching this video. I'm so grateful. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Joe and I are going to have a new video out on Monday. I'm not sure what we're doing the video on yet. So as always, I ask you guys, if there's something you want us to do a video on, let me know. We're happy to do that. Other than that, have a wonderful weekend. I'll show you the picture of my tattoo on Sunday night. And God bless everybody. And I will see you on Monday.